Okay, so this is my topic. There's this is I'm actually the legitimate user of this picture. I took it. It goes viral. I've seen on describing varieties that don't belong to me. It's on pamphlets of companies that never ask permission. But I'm the only one legitimately allowed to use that photo. I used to call that plant precious. It was so cute. It was only this big and full of fruit, and it tasted lousy. But anyway. <laughs> Uh, so here's my outline. I'm going to say some general things first, then get into the biology and uh, production specifics. So there's a general thing. Too many times, this is our kind of our production system sequence. We start out with our plants, we grow them under some system, we have a product, and then we do a market. And unfortunately, a lot of people do it exactly one step at a time, never considering the next step. You know, I've even had, I've had people actually, not with Haskat, but with strawberries, telling me, I've bought a case of strawberries, how do I plant them? And then when they grow, they're going to call me up when they're growing and say, okay, we're, the strawberries are ripe, I've got to sell them, what do I do now? Right? Really what you need to be thinking first is your market. Because a certain market might need a certain kind of product, and a certain product might need a certain system, and a certain type of plant. There's certain varieties in the world that are more suitable for picking on versus machines, right? Uh, on the system thing, if, like, let's say you're doing a U-pick. You do not want weeds in your patch. But if you're a wholesaler of fruit, you can have a lot more weed tolerance. So you need to be doing that. Uh, you also need to do understand that there's different kinds of plants that are hardy, easy care, and good quality, right? And actually HASCAP, uh, for, certainly for the cold hardy plants, fits all of these together. It's both hardy, fairly easy to care for compared to other fruits, and it's got very good quality. But a lot of people new to orchards think growing something is like Jack and the Beanstalk. Well, if that's going to be a bush this big, I can just plant it right, up, right in my forage area, and it's going to grow bigger and shade out everything. You know, this is the Jack and the Beanstalk syndrome of thinking it's really easy. So if you're brand new to something, you really want to start out small to make sure you know what you're doing before going large scale. I also recommend that people try several fruit crops, even though I love Hascap the most. Uh, it's nice to have, uh, find out what you can grow and sell if you're new to fruit, but you can also spread out your harvest. A lot of people are interested in Haskett because it is bringing cash flow in earlier than the other crops. You can harvest before the others, so that's adding to their diversity, right? So it's better labor use. You don't need all your pickers to come in only two weeks, you've got something to do after HASCAP and beyond that. And it makes reduced risk there. Now this is based on the prairies uh, growing season, and maybe we shifted a month earlier here, I don't know. But uh, in early season, for us, there's only three crops to choose from. There's strawberries, Saskatoons, and HASCAP. And HASCAP can be as early as late June and all through July uh, with some of the more existing varieties right now. But for the prairies, when we get to uh, later in the season, we have lots and lots of choices. So it's pretty easy to focus on ASCAP uh, for me because it's the only thing fruiting for a while. One of the things I look at with ASCAP in our program is really into mechanical harvesting. We were really into it almost a decade before we got an actual harvester. <laughs> We uh, pretended to be machines, shaking things with our hands and, to, and then throwing the berries around and seeing which ones would fit machinery. But one of the key things that our uh, ag economics people like is the idea that you could get a harvesting machine and that same machine could be used to harvest different kinds of fruit. And my idea on, in the breeding part has been to breed the plants to fit the machinery, right? A lot of people just make the machines to fit them, do it the other way around. So with HASCAP, uh, the same machinery you can do that might also be able to do raspberries, 
our dwarf sour cherries, currants, uh, and Saskatoon berries. Now I understand uh, blue. I'm not. We don't grow blueberries on the prairies, but I think the harvesting machines for that can do it. But I'm not sure that I don't think this machine can do a blueberry harvest because uh, I've been told it's too fragile. It, it would probably break. So you'd have to pick the right kind of machine if you're doing that. So what crops go good together? Well, if you're making similar products that you could do similar marketing but have a different harvest season. You don't want to make Hascap liqueur and apple pies and jam of some other species and think you're going to have a concerted marketing plan. You should be thinking if you're going to have multiple crops, uh, try to go with some similar product that you could be selling. So on the prairies, what we have uh, kind of developed is we have Hascap in June, but now it's actually more July. Uh, Saskatoons would be only in July, and our cherries would be August, and that could spread out our mechanical harvested fruit. Right? When you buy that machinery, you're not just harvesting one crop, but doing many things. So there's just saying in words what I've kind of already said. I guess the other part that's on there is that bees, uh, Hascap is one of the first plants to bloom in the springtime. It blooms around the time of willows, and we'll get into that a little further, but it can enhance your bee population. If they're, if they're waiting another three weeks for your other crops to bloom, you could be feeding your bees for, for a while, and they'll be healthier, hopefully, because they're all getting sick anyway. But, uh, Okay. With a little bit more breeding, however, we're probably going to have Hascap all summer long. Our most recent release ripened in, for us, the first week in August, right? And that's just the tip of the iceberg. We're, we're now into the uh, breeding cycle where the government has given us money for nine years, and the things we planted five years ago are now starting to fruit, and we're, we were trying to extend the season to different types of varieties that would harvest. This is not individual plants, but this is different groups of varieties that would allow you to have it going throughout the summer. But in Saskatchewan, we have a lot of growers that just fit Hascap into some other operation, not connected to fruit at all, just to have something, you know, they're uh, running cattle or doing something else, and they just add it on as a new thing. Um, I'm going to be on a sabbatical starting this July to write a Hascap manual. There's already a lot of stuff on our website, and uh, I've written, we've written two other ones, uh, the Sour Cherry one, and then Alberta didn't even credit the University of Saskatchewan, we wrote the book. <laughs> they edited their final edit, but we, uh, we had lost our printing press due to bad investment by the by the uh, campus, and uh, all, like three fourths of the authors are from Saskatchewan. They left us that. They put our names in it, but anyway. So anyway. now to get into Hascap biology. This is a map of the boreal forests around the world, and Hascap uh, is in the boreal forests and wetlands. It's, for some reason, it kind of is missing off the west coast. Like, it's not really in Norway, but it's in Sweden. And it's not in BC. It, it sort of disappears around here. It doesn't even get to Alaska. Except for that uh, area, the rest is the area that you could find Hascap in the wild. There are several different uh, types of Hascap, and we'll get into more of that later. But uh, there's Russian types that are from this region of the world. The Japanese are from here. The Kuril Island ones are here. And then there's a whole bunch of wild ones in Canada and a little bit into the U.S. Each of them have uh, different uh, characteristics. And as a breeder, I, we've been collecting these. I know that Northern European wild Hascap tastes bitter. And it's really hard to find a good tasting one. The Russian main ones uh, tend to be early harvesting, thin fruit, but uniform ripening, and variable flavor. Uh, the Japanese ones 
I think I've got more slides on this later. Maybe I shouldn't go over it too much now. But anyway, the Japanese one has their points, and uh, the Canadian ones we don't know too much about yet. On my last sabbatical, this is where I gathered Hascap from. If you can believe I did this all during the growing season, uh, eight years and seven years ago. And I always rented a car that had unlimited mileage. <laughs> I think in the Maritimes, I actually put 5,000 kilometers on in a week and a half. Uh, so this is actually a map of Canada's northernmost highways. I, I was like zooming down the highway and I got used to where it would grow in the wild. I'd pull over, go look, find plants, and then I'd have to drive at least 20 minutes beyond that before I'd get out and look again. So we have a huge collection. Uh, I guess it's, that's the number. I'm sure we've killed off some of those, but we probably have at least 1,200, 1,300 wild ass across uh, the country. And some of them are really bizarre locations, which this doesn't mean Hascap can always do this, but it might be in the breeding pool. Uh, some places along the St. Lawrence Seaway, they were just a foot up from the ocean and on the little island, right? So salt water's got to be spraying on that. Uh, the northernmost peak of uh, New Brunswick where this lighthouse, all the trees are growing sideways, and there's Hascap, one of them. And the, it was like this tall there. Uh, up here in Manitoba, the calciums are so alkaline that they're white. And has, that was a very good area to find, uh, find Hascap. But we also found some down in Zone 6. So this is, I, I like to talk about this because that's our, our next big project is uh, breeding a lot with the wild stuff to see what we might get out of it. Here, oh, there's a New Brunswick site uh, with the trees going sideways. And there's a, a wild has cap. I just yanked him out of the ground sometimes. <laughs> uh, that was a particularly large one. Like, okay, so it was, I don't know how old those plants were. They could have been 100 years old for I knew, for all I knew. One thing interesting about Hascap is that it blooms before the last frost comes. It bloom, in our location, the early Hascap bloomed one month before our last frost. And they take to minus seven outside and, uh, before they get damaged. I have heard of Hascap getting damaged in Saskatchewan one year where it was both raining and, or snowing and minus ten and heavy wind. And that was the only time I know of it going bad. The trouble, though, is whether you've got a bee that's going to come by, too. Well, one of our physiologists is a real smart ass. Uh, <laughs> he says, it can't be. It can't survive. So he put Hascap plants in a growth chamber, sprayed water up into them, and lo and behold, they did die at like minus three. That's kind of the reason why the flowers go down like that. It's to keep the water out of there. And uh, there's a girl doing research on the flowers. They have very high sugar content of the nectar up there, which is probably acting like an antifreeze. And if you dilute that water somehow, unnaturally, don't go out in your fields and spray them with bottles upside down when it's minus. <laughs> anyway, uh, so that's really a good thing because you could put it in an area that maybe does get a little frost. Uh, and it's not going to matter much. Like we get frost almost every day in the nighttime in that area, in our area, when it's blooming. So the flowers are actually very uh, fast to bloom. This is an old paper, but uh, when they had planted one year, the following year, eight out of 14 bushes were blooming. We've made little cuttings for propagation that are single node cuttings and had flowers on them the next year. So that doesn't mean you're going to get production the next year, but you are going to be able to taste the fruit and start thinking of what products or experimenting with products shortly after. When uh, we did ours, uh, first three varieties, all of them bloomed the second year, after, the year after planting. And growing them from seed, it actually takes two years and they, they will fruit. 
So the, the berry is actually has two ovaries in it, which has two flowers that go to it, right? So, and every bud that breaks usually makes three pairs of berries, and some of them can be quite different on the end here. Like some will make a point, this one kind of looks, uh, reminds me of those red delicious apple a little bit. Uh, they look, this is actually a deformity, they, this outer sheath covers it. I think I've got, so what happens is sometimes the two flowers, uh, and I think it's probably on this picture, maybe not. well here's a, a set of two flowers. Sometimes one of these will open one day, and the other one will open the next day. It's almost like a guarantee that that berry is going to work. But this would be the full set, but this is one where one flower opened on a good day and the second flower opened on a rainy day. And so this one didn't get, only half got pollinated. This one hardly, might have only gotten one pollen grain. Right, so that's, these are, this would all be symptomatic if you didn't have good enough uh, bee populations. Right, you start seeing these uh, curvy berries. So what pollinates has cap? There's a study ongoing in Saskatchewan, and I think uh, uh, more of you talk later, but bumblebees seem to be the best, but there's not as many in the springtime. Uh, honeybees are good. Mason bees aren't that great. And uh, various wild bees and flies will do it. But they are not wind pollinated, and some people think they can get leaf cutter bees, but that's, they like it much warmer than when Hascap is blooming. So don't count on leaf cutter bees. But uh, we'll have more on that a little bit later. So why grow Hascap? I love this picture of that girl. <laughs> so enthusiastic. Uh, they can be sweet and or sour. The good varieties have a fresh berry flavor and a special zinc. And, uh, I like to pre-prejudice people a little bit because of the experience I had with one of my weird strawberries that no one understands, right? I made these in my PhD thesis, hybridizing one, and I had this one that was a cross between uh, a strawberry from, from uh, India that tasted like an apple banana, hybridized with another strawberry, the alpine strawberry, that is really intense strawberry flavor. And the child of these two tasted weird. And I would take farmers out and say, want to try my weird strawberry hybrids? And they would eat one and they'd go, ha -ha. you know, they'd smile politely and never eat another one. Until one day, one of the farmers says, that tastes like it's got coconut in it. And the other farmers went, yeah, it does. And they ate, and they ate, and they ate. <laughs> right? So I like to say that has cap tastes like blueberry raspberry. And to slightly prejudice people to try, they probably like one of those flavors. It does have a little bit like that. One of the other breeders uh, uh, likes to say, no, no, it's a brand new flavor. And I keep thinking of my weird strawberries. So I like to prejudice people a little bit when they go to try it. But actually, there can be really bad varieties. Some. Some actually taste just like tonic water. And unfortunately, some of the first varieties we got from Russia were like that. I found out years later that some of the breeders had bred them to be bitter to add to vodka. So they didn't have to buy tonic water. That's, that's the story I got. So some actually, and they actually, you know, quinine used to be uh, a clear, a kind of a treatment for malaria. They used to, in Russia, if they had someone going to the tropics and came back with malaria, they would feed them hascap of that bitter kind. The other thing is hascap can also take grassy, and that's a sign of not being ripe yet. And unfortunately, like just like blueberries, it will look purple on the outside before it's ripe inside. You really need to bite it in half and see that there's been so much purple that the berry is almost completely purple on the inside. Some of the newer, fatter varieties will never get purple all the way in the center, but it should get like two-thirds all the way through. But the current varieties on the market get purple on the inside. 